So one of the things, and I don't want to like harp on my, my issues because don't you get bored with some of the, every time you meet with them, they're talking about their ailments. I do. I mean, I want you to talk about your ailments, but not all the time. And so, but there's some, been some lessons I've been learning through this process that I feel like are beneficial. I know they're beneficial to me and I feel like they're beneficial to you. And uh, because we all have our stuff, we all have our challenges. And so my left shoulder began to lock up on me and um, to the point that I couldn't hardly, hardly use it. Um, had an MRI and for you that have had an MRI, I just, I just want to bow down to you because that's almost like a life without chocolate milk. It's very tight quarters. Anybody ever had an MRI? My fear is I'll get stuck in there and then they'll go on vacation. <laughs> and there is no getting out. You're squeezed in your tighter than toothpaste. Anyway, um, so I had an MRI. And so I get a call from our doctor on Friday a week ago and she said, first words out of her mouth, she said, Pastor Craig, she said, your shoulder is a mess. And I said, well, that's great news. How much is that going to cost me? <laughs> and she said, well, your rotator cuff is tore. Your labrum's had compound tears. You have arthritis in it, and it's going to demand surgery. And probably eight to 12 weeks more rehab. That is the message you get on Monday, not on Friday. And I was like, is there anything else you'd like to talk to me about? No, nope, that's sufficient. I said, okay, well, praise the Lord. I was not a real happy camper. Um, I'm a pretty active guy. And um, thinking of eight to, tw- eight to 12 weeks more of rehab, and, and it's been mentioned that you'll probably be sleeping in your recliner for those weeks. And I mean, my wife has a very nice decorative recliner, but not one you want to sleep in for eight to 12 weeks. I already told her, I said, honey, if I have to have this surgery, the Lord can heal me. And I'm bleeding for that. I'm just telling you right now, I'm going to Mathis Brothers. Thank you very much. And I'm going to get me the biggest, comfiest, cushiony that I just said and just wrapped itself around me. I just, if she lets me. We guys know we're all talk. <laughs> There's all bark, no bite. But anyway, I'm hoping that God will lead her in that direction. <laughs> I was praying about it. I said, God, seriously, I mean, you know, I mean, it is, it's a stroke enough. I mean, I mean, why, what's up with this? I mean, do you ever talk to God like that? Like, what in the world is going on? I mean, in case you haven't noticed, we're having some issues here. Here, and this is what the Holy Spirit whispered to me, and it's amazing. It's amazing how He pulls things from places that you have never thought of, because He's He's God. He moves He moves in a different realm. This is what He spoke to me in my whining. He said, son, you need to fight fire with fire. So what's the meaning of the phrase fighting fire with fire? I I thought I had a semblance of an idea. and So I just went and did some studying. One of the answers is to respond to an attack by using a similar method as one's attacker. What's the origin of the phrase, fight fire with fire? When we fight fire with fire, we're likely to employ more extreme methods than we normally do. This is a little history lesson here, but that is what Shakespeare was referring to in King John's 1595, when he said, when he wrote, 
Be stirring as the time. Be fire with fire. Threaten the threatener. <laughs> Amen. Get out of your recliner. Stand to your feet. Bow your shoulders. Bow your back. And pull the sword and threaten the threatener. In other words, draw a line in the sand and simply say it ends here and now. Threaten the threatener and outface the brow of the bragging whore. The source of this phrase was actual firefighting that was taken on by U.S. settlers in the 19th century. So fast forward to the 21st century. And we have an in-house expert in regard to fire. Major Mike Jones is retired. And I've asked Mike to come. And he's going he's gonna to share with you in brief what fighting fire with fire really is all about. Practical, technical sense. Would you give this good-looking man a hand? Come on, Mike. Thank you, buddy. Good morning, church. God is good, isn't he? And all the time. All the time. Hey, Amen. He said expert, and I was looking to see who was behind me. <laughs> when Pastor asked me to speak on backfire, I was reminded of when I was about 10 to 11 years old, and I mowed our yard for the first time by myself with no help and no shirt, just shorts and shoes on. And for the next three days, mowing in weather like we've had recently, I had a pretty good backfire. <laughs> of course, that's not what he asked me to speak about. I remember 16, 17 years old, and had a Z28 Camaro 350 automatic in it. You guys know what I'm talking about. And they get a little more air to them when you flip the lid of the breather over and you can see that element. But when they backfire, you have the evidence of the burnt paint on the hood. That's not quite the backfire he asked me to speak about either. But in the fire service, let me say that for those that don't know, there are three elements needed for a fire to survive. Fuel, oxygen, and heat. Removing any of those or a combination of those three, and the fuel dies, or the fire dies, excuse me, it goes out. Ground cover firefighting, or grass fires as most people know them, are much more difficult to fight than a structure fire because you don't have to chase a structure, especially in windy conditions, and they really get out of control, and you've seen that on the news. In ground cover firefighting, a fire break is anything that can be used to obstruct the path growth or advancement of a ground cover fire, such as a street, a highway, creek or ravine, a pond or a lake. When there's no natural fire break and one is needed, oftentimes a backfire can be considered and utilized. A backfire is essentially setting a fire intentionally by the firefighters ahead of and in path of an oncoming fire, drawing that line in the sand the pastor was talking about. It's used to consume the fuel of an oncoming fire. Remember one of those three elements. When used correctly, it stops a fire in its tracks or confines it, making it much easier. Making, making it much easier to control by redirecting its path. So essentially, when you set a backfire, you're getting ahead of the fire and you're facing it, as Pastor mentioned a few moments ago, head on drawing that line in the sand, getting rid of the fuel by the backfire that you've set, the controlled burn, and then when the fire gets to you, it has nowhere to go, it's out of fuel. And let me just say, real briefly, personally, I can, I can say that no matter what I've faced, when the enemy comes against me, I know one who can and always has set a spiritual backfire on my behalf and stop the enemy in his tracks and put him out every time. Amen, thank you, Mike. Thank you, Mike. So this is exactly what I feel like the Holy Spirit has said to me concerning my own personal walk and challenges. And I believe that God is saying this to many of you as we go through this message this morning over the next few moments is we simply need to 
to stand our ground and not just okay, Sarah, Sarah, and just what will be, will be. As believers, we have great authority in Christ. In believers, God has given us many great promises in the word of God concerning situations that we face and battles that we fight. And how many know in every situation, every circumstance, that all the weaponry, all the tools, all the resources are there for us to embrace that we might live in victory. God never intended for us to walk in defeat, but always to walk in victory. Now we understand that in the spiritual realm, fighting fire with fire, we do not arm ourselves, we do not arm ourselves with similar weapons of our adversary. But we as believers, we arm ourselves with the weapons of God. We fight our physical, mental, emotional, financial fires with spiritual fire. And I can guarantee you that there are some fires that are burning, some out of control, even in this building, even by media this morning, that you need God to come to your rescue and you need to fight that fire with kingdom fire. As David faced a giant named Goliath in his day, he shouted across the valley in 1 Samuel 17, you come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel whom you have defied. And this day, the Lord will deliver you into my hand and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. How many believe there's still a God in Israel and Jehovah is his name? And all the assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's. And he will give you into our hands. This is how we fight our battles. This is how we fight fire with fire. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 10, for though we walk in the flesh, we deal with these fleshly issues we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty in God for pulling down strongholds and casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts except against the knowledge of God and bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Continues to deal with this issue of fighting fire with fire and the weapons of our warfare in Ephesians chapter 6. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and the rulers of the darkness of this age. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore. So am I, I'm here to declare to all who's listening, who's looking on, I'm standing. I am still standing. When the dust settles, I'm still standing. When Satan has taken his best shot, I'm still standing. I shall still proclaim the word of God. The calling of God is still upon my life. I will not waver. I will not run. I will not retreat. But I will stand my ground in the power of the Spirit and the anointing of God. Because God is my Savior. Satan is defeated. And I am victorious in Jesus' name. Put your hands together and bless his name. We are more than a conqueror through him that loved us. Hallelujah. We refuse to bow. We refuse to bend. We will stand our ground in Christ. Hallelujah. 
we will fight fire with fire. You know, Satan really did not anticipate the third day. All he counted on was Friday. <laughs> he was not a very good listener because Jesus was telling all that would listen, they're going to kill me, they're going to take my life on Friday, but just, one, just know this one thing, very early on the third morning, I'm getting up. <laughs> and I'll have keys of death, of death and hell in my hands, and I will walk in victory and power and salvation and redemption. And Satan, he has the same mind block, brain block today because what he has meant for evil in my life, in your life, God is going to turn for good. And he's going to regret the day that he tried to move in on our territory because God is going to give us more grace and God is going to give us more power and God is going to give us more revelation and anointing and truth as we declare the living word of God and he shall build his church and he shall build it through our hearts and our hands. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. Listen, I'm, you don't have to convince me. I'm convinced. No one has to come up to me and say, hey, I hope you get better. I'm getting well. <laughs> a couple of things I just want to share with you. Then we're going we're gonna to have, have a prayer line this morning. We're going to pray for the sick. We're going to fight fire with fire. I'm so pumped. <laughs> Consider this. Elijah the prophet back in Kings, the book of Kings. He declared a drought over Israel because of their sins, their wickedness. And for three and a half years, God closed the heavens above Israel. And in 1 Kings 17 and 8, then the word of the Lord came to Elijah, go at once to Zarephath in the region of Sidon and stay there. And I have, listen, I have directed, I have directed a widow there. Seriously? Why not? I have directed Crest there. Or Brahms there. But I have directed a widow there. See, God does everything for his glory. And his kingdom sake, his ways are far above our ways, past finding out. I have directed a widow there to supply you with food. Seriously, I mean, that's the last person I'd be looking for a meal from. So he went to Zarephath, and when he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called her and asked, would you bring me a little water in a jar so I may drink? And as she was going to get it, he called, and by the way, would you pre please bring me a piece of bread? Preachers are never satisfied. <laughs> They're always asking for more. No amens, please. As surely as the Lord your God lives, she replies, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar, and a little olive oil in a jug. And I am out here gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat it and what? Die. I mean, that's at a pretty serious juncture in your life. And Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Go home and do as you have said, but first make a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me and then make something for yourself and your son. And she's thinking, he's not listening to me. See, the difference was he was listening to God. And God speaks on a different wavelength than our physical ears. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, according to Elijah, the jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the land. In other words, for the next three and a half years, God is going to be your provision. Amen. So she went away and did as Elijah had told her. And so there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and her entire family. For the jar of flour was not used up and the jug of oil did not run dry. In keeping with 
in keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah, the interpretation went out this morning from the Lord, and he said, get in alignment with my word. Listen, there's just situations in your life that you cannot, in your own physical ability or analytic, you cannot maneuver the situation that you're in. We must align ourselves with the word of God. There is one thing that God responds to, and that's his word. That day, this widow was preparing to die, her last supper, so to speak, for her and her son. That day, this widow fought the fire of poverty with the fire of generosity. Now, somebody needs to hear this this morning because God has spoke this into my spirit for this particular moment in time. The only kingdom strategy for increase, listen to me, the only kingdom strategy to increase your harvest is to increase your seed. If you want a greater harvest, then you've got to sow a greater amount of seed into the ground. And see, the problem with us mentally in our own understanding, in our own intellect, in our own reasoning is when things get tight, we hold on the tighter. And that is totally opposite to what God said needs to happen. When things start getting tight, God says, sow more seed into the kingdom. If you want to increase your kingdom harvest, then you must increase your seed. I've, I've mentioned this before in messages over 25 years of ministry here. The truth is that for the most of you this morning, you pretty well know your pay package from month to month. You know what you're going to be making, your bonuses, the the incentives that are there, the amenities that are provided. And so therefore, you can adjust your budget based on a known factor in how many knows that it's still good sense to live within your means, to spend less than you make. Amen? Because I've had people say, well, I'm paying my tithe and I'm still in a hole. But they're just, they're in diligence all day long. And they've not come to grips with stewardship concerning their finance. I could say a lot here, but I'm not going to because that's for a different day, a different spirit. Now here at at Bethesda, in any church, okay, we have a budget as well, just as you do. We have an electric bill. We have a mortgage payment. We have these items set in stone in regard to what it takes to have the building open for you every Sunday. Now the challenge for us is that we don't have the guarantee as far as finance every Sunday. Because it is based upon your obedience to the word concerning tithe. So every month it's like, Jesus, Jesus, how I trust you, <laughs> how I've proved you or and or. And I'm t- there's times I have prayed for you, I have prayed for you, not for health or joy, or, but I pray, God, stir them up to give. <laughs> you say, well, the church, it has plenty of money. <laughs> Perfect. In a perfect world, we do. Now, I'm just th- throwing this out. This is, this is in line with my message. Just our electric bill is $3,000 a month. And we have almost 50,000 square feet under roof here. I'm just saying it costs something to run the ministry. And so there's been times in the past, over the years, it's got very tight because some of you have taken some extended vacations and took your money with you. (laughs) 
We dread summers. <laughs> That's why we love online giving. You can give from Guadalajara. Hallelujah. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus, for online giving. But, but this is what, this is how I've approached this because I want to approach it scripturally because this isn't mine, this is his. This isn't the boards, this is the kingdom. This is kingdom stuff. And so now we start getting tight in our budget here at Bethesda. Oh, by the way, our mortgage is over 13,000 a month. So I hope you're enjoying the bathrooms. And if you'd be willing to pay it off, we would be debt free. That would be wonderful. See me after church, I'll stay after just for you. What I do, as I do what God says in the word, you need more kingdom harvest, you need to sow more seed. So I will go into the bookkeeper and I'd say, we need to sow some seed today, this week. So send that much to that missionary, send that much to that missionary, send that, that's that. we have a single mom, send her some money. We just start putting seed in the ground. Because if I'm going to ask you to do it, then I've got to have the courage to do it myself. What am I doing? I'm fighting fire with fire. See, Satan is trying to squeeze us in any way he can. He'll squeeze us financially if he possibly can. So therefore, the, the kingdom rebuttal is this, that if you're going to try to squeeze me financially, then I'm going to sow some seed financially, and it's going to guarantee a harvest. It's amazing. It's amazing how that every single time we start throwing seed into the ground, it, that God is always creative, but always comes back. You cast that bread on the water, it's going to come back to you. This is good. This is a good word. This is a good word because we all live there. Just a quick example. I'll move on because I'm going to wrap this up in a few minutes. But we have some rental property and we had a 30-day contract on some rental property. And, and I got a, a letter in the mail from this short-term renter. And they said to me, they said, Pastor, we love the place so much. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna double the rent. And I, was, I kept l- looking for a PS. <laughs> like, we ran the car through the garage door. <laughs> Out of nowhere, he just doubled the rent. That's what I said. Praise God. I, I emailed him back and I said, you didn't have to do this, but praise God. And I just smiled all the way to the bank. What was that about? Seed in the ground. As you give, God said, I'll give back to you. Press down, shaking together, running over, shall who? Men given to your bosoms. Fight poverty with the fire of generosity. Give will be given to you good measure, pressed down, shaking together, and running over will be put into your bosom for with the same measure that you use, you give, it will be measured back again to you. The NLT says the amount you give will determine the amount you get back. Now, there's not more I could say here, but I'm, I'm going I'm to move along. Second Corinthians, no, let me give you this word, then I'm going to move on. The point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. And everybody believes that, said yes. Yes. Second, Paul and Silas imprisoned in the inner cell as they preached the gospel. You know the story, I'm sure. They're preaching, praying, laying hands on the sick, and the Bible says that they were beaten with rods, almost to death, cast into an inner prison, locked in chains in this dungeon. But at the midnight hour, what did they do? They lifted up praise, songs, and prayer to God. They fought the fires of pain with the fires of praise. And God did what? He came to their rescue. He came to their rescue. So when you're feeling down, you're feeling 
pain in your body, in your heart, in your mind, just begin to praise and magnify the Lord. It is amazing, it is amazing how that the pain of your situation will take flight as you begin to lift up and magnify that name that is above every name. So this brings me to this moment as we bring this to a close. According to Psalms 34, 1, the psalmist David said, in one of the darkest, most painful days of his life, I will bless the Lord at all times. Say all times. In other words, that's blessing him on Monday just like you do on Sunday. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. And let us exalt his name together. Listen now. I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all of my fears. Those who look to him are radiant and their faces shall never be ashamed. Then he says, this poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his trouble. Why? Because the angel of the Lord encamps round about those who fear him and delivers them. So this morning, I am, I have been that poor man crying. I hurt. I hurt. The truth of the matter is, kind of like that old saying we've heard over the last few years, ain't nobody got time for this. I ain't got time for this. So this morning, I'm going to fight fire with fire. The fire of hurt with the fire of healing. Amen. God said you're hurting. Are you okay? Yes, Lord. Matter of fact, it's bothering me so much that I can't sleep in my own bed. Now, when a man has to sleep on the couch, there are several things going on in that marriage. Vic and I's marriage is strong. There's, but I just can't get comfortable in the bed so every night I make my bed on the couch I get my Hillsong instrumental music right beside me and I'd say from the living room good night honey she says good night honey kind of like the Waltons good night John boy good night Mary Ellen I'm tired of the couch. I'm tired of not being able to use this arm. I'm sick and tired of not being able to raise it all the way to him. I, I want and I will be able to lift that arm all the way and praise and honor to the king that I serve. So when the Holy Spirit said to me, well, if you're hurting, you just need to fight fire with fire. You need to have a healing service. Fight the fires of hurt with the fires of healing. And something's going to happen. <laughs> yeah. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities and who heals all your diseases. For the Lord sustains him on his sick bed, and in his illness you shall restore him to full health. Anybody in the house believe in healing? He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, by his stripes, we were healed. We are healed. The healing has already been paid for. 
You have to beg him for it. It's already there. There's healing in this house. Why? Because he's in this house and he is the healer. He is the great physician. God sent his word. He said, I am the word. And when he's in the house, the word's in the house, there's healing in the house because that's God's promises to us. Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. Save me, and I shall be saved, for you are my praise. Jesus said, I'm going to anoint you to heal the sick, to raise the dead, to cleanse the leper, to cast out demons. James 5 and 14, is any among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord, and the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord, and the Lord will raise him up. This is how we fight our battles. The fire of hurt, the fire of healing. I'm gonna invite our prayer team to come this morning. They're gonna come, they're gonna stand across the front of this building facing you. Would you come, ladies and gentlemen, please. As they come, I want to read two more scriptures to you, then we're going to pray, pray for the sick. Philippians 4 and 7, in the ESV version, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone, for the Lord is at hand. And do not be anxious about anything, and listen, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasseth all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Listen to what the message says, a very modern day version. Celebrate God all day, every day. I mean, revel in Him. Make it as clear as you can to all you meet that you're on their side, working with them and not against them. Help them see that the master is about to arrive. How many is ready for the master to arrive this morning? I've asked the Lord, you gotta walk among us because I can't heal anyone. It's you, you are the healer. The Bible says the power of the Lord was present to heal. I've asked for that power and that anointing to be, and it's here. Let them see that the master is about to arrive. He could show up at, at any minute, at any moment. So don't fret or worry. Instead of worrying, pray. And let petitions and praises shape your worries into prayers, letting God know your concerns. And before you know it, a sense of God's wholeness and everything coming together for good will come and settle you down. And it's wonderful what happens when Christ displaces worry at the center of your life. Now I want this body to look around and, and understand why that we need Him in the house. Bethesda is a house of mercy is a house of healing. That's what God has called us to be. And I'm here this morning because God spoke to me in my hurt, in my pain. And he said, you need to fight fire with fire, son. You need to draw a line in the sand Sunday morning. And you need to, you need to lay hands on the people, anointing them with oil. And you need to fight that hurt with healing. The promises of my healing and as you pray out of your pain my promises are going to manifest themselves amen so I'm just standing in obedience to God's word so as the worship team prepares to sing this is how we fight our battles I'm going to ask you to come and stand all across the front of this building come on stand in front of me. 